That's good. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, and uh, thank you to the Oneida County History Center for inviting me to speak tonight, and thank all of you for attending online. This evening's lecture is titled Canal Archaeology in Utica, which is actually an umbrella for two separate shorter talks. Each of these talks illustrates some of the variety of perspectives or approaches to data generated by New York State Museum archaeologists working on New York State DOT's North-South Arterial Project and the Route 5S project here in Utica. The North-South Arterial Project involved archaeological and historical surveys, testing, the excavation of six sites, and archaeological monitoring. One of the excavated sites was the 1026-1028 Lincoln Avenue site, which included domestic deposits and Shenango Canal-related features. The second talk this evening focuses on an interesting historical tangent that was sparked by our archaeological findings along the Shenango Canal. It's an interesting tale of politics and corruption. Hopefully, you are not too politically fatigued to find the story interesting. The more recent DOT activity in Utica has been the 5S project. Archaeological surveys were conducted and construction's been monitored by archaeologists. The first section of tonight's lecture describes some of our observation of Erie Canal walls and the underground remnants of some of the many bridges that once spanned the canal through the city. I want to briefly make the point that archaeological findings are rarely complete. There are few Pompeys out there. The deposits and structures found during archaeology are often just pieces and parts of larger holes. Through time, artifacts, features, and sites are modified and deteriorate from use and continue to decay after abandonment. Often, they are subject to intentional dismantling, filling, and grading. Canal sites, or any sites in urban areas, are then impacted by residential and commercial building, highway construction, and underground utility construction. Further, large complex sites and features such as canals are also only archeologically visible and documented through small samples or windows. It's impossible to expose it all simultaneously. The exposures revealed during monitoring are not ideal and unlike any archeological images you've ever seen. So I'll try to, I'll try to point out some of the details of what we saw, but I, I admit it's kind of difficult to see in those conditions. As I said, this part of the lecture looks at the Erie Canal, Utica, and its bridges. I'll be describing some of our recent findings, but beyond that, I'd like to demonstrate what archaeology can contribute to our understanding of a historic transportation network that's already register listed and designated as a national landmark. The Erie Canal is a very well-known part of our collective historic consciousness. Clinton's Ditch, Gateway to the West, the canal that made New York the Empire State, and New York City the economic capital that it is. It was finished in 1825 and was enlarged the last time in 1918 when it became the Barge Canal. This section of the Erie Canal through Utica, though, was left open as a spur until 1922. We all have an image of the Erie Canal and its aqueducts, ports, and bridges as formed from our personal experiences and our observations. The canal has long been part of the New York State Public School curriculum. The canal and associated features are displayed and interpreted at parks and sites across the state from Albany to Buffalo. Waterford, Rome, Chittenango, Syracuse, Camillus, Port Byron, Ockport, etc. 
The canal is central to heritage tourism development. The Heritage Corridor now touts clean water recreation and fresh air. It sponsors fun runs and canal side festivals. Bike trails have been built along multiple segments. Anything that brings history and heritage to the public is terrific. Yet, there are shortcomings. Like most other histories, perhaps any collective knowledge, the, the image and, and narrative of the Erie Canal has been simplified for the ease of presentation, structural framing, and digestibility. The sections that are displayed and interpreted tend to be the most picturesque, best preserved, massive stone masonry. And perhaps these, these parts are only representative of brief periods of operations. Our shared understanding is also influenced by historical nostalgia. The Low Bridge Everybody Down song was penned in 1905 capitalizing on a personal nostalgia for the old days of the canal as the motorized barges replaced the mule. Hopefully, everyone recognizes that our collective simplified, static, sanitized image of the canal that's been codified in the National Register listing and the National Landmark designations that it's received, it doesn't completely capture the variability and the complexity of this transportation system. This system and its features continue to have the potential to provide more information. Today, there are few reminders of the canal through Utica. In fact, many lifelong residents have no idea that it passed through the city center. This is a view of the Genesee Street Bridge taken from the east in front of the current um, Observer Dispatch Building. New York State Museum archaeologists monitored this extensive DOT construction project in Utica along a mile of Route 5S or Oriskany Street. Construction is replacing much of the route through this part of the city and included the replacement of nearly all existing underground utilities. As I mentioned, monitoring is less than ideal archeology. span In New York, the methods reserved for urban situations with traffic considerations, paving, and potentially deeply buried resources that would prevent or limit normal procedures. It might be better described as information salvage, a Hail Mary, or pardon me, a last ditch effort to identify and evaluate resources. I previously presented a paper regarding Utica monitoring and, and just for fun, I, I included a brief ethnographic description of highway construction workers, what, when they ate, how they ate, uh, what they did, um, how, just, just how they worked. But after I wrote that paper, I discovered something and I wanted to, to correct what I had said in that previous paper. And, and that discovery was construction workers do eat salad. <laughs> construction though has progressed through multiple phases and operations, each one revealing another slice of the canal corridor. There's been sewers built, storm drains, water lines, curb drains, manholes, utility vaults and conduits, signal conduits, and roadbed grading. Some of the intersections have been sliced through eight different times over the last year and a half. And, and each slice at varying depths and sizes provide just another hint at what remains under the streets and sidewalks. We've managed to document multiple segments of walls as, as seen in red bars. In fact, there are a few more that aren't on this map. Uh, portions of, red, of six bridges are in the red ovals, and there are countless examples of early subsurface infrastructure. Um, storm drains, uh, stone arch storm drains that actually date to the 1830s and, and um, 
historic water pipes, of course, still being used as uh, uh, by city city water. It's remarkable how old the infrastructure actually is. But the wall instruction observed to date has been highly variable. The following are examples of typical stone masonry construction, similar to those seen at the interpretive sites that I, saw, I showed you before with the very fine masonry. All of these walls have precisely shaped and fit stones with finished or dressed faces. Many of them are bull nosed along the, the outer edge. Uh, we found that the better quality masonry associates with the major street crossings, like at Genesee Street and John. This is an end view of a wall, um, and it shows you how it retains its integrity, even while being assaulted by a large excavator. Uh, these walls were so well built, they're, they're hard to tear apart even with modern equipment. This is a view of a block long section of wall located just under a sidewalk. This would be just north of the synagogue, um, um, west of Franklin Square. There was some mortar that we found on top of this wall section. Can anybody make out the uh, footprint? I'll outline it. So that, that was uh, pretty interesting. Um, to, to see that someone at some point during this wall construction just walked through the mortar. This portion of the wall was observed inside a manhole where it formed one side of, of the underground space. The utility company had made use of the wall uh, rather than building, uh, building the manhole completely. That wall exposure was located next to the Genesee Street Bridge. This close-up of the same stretch shows a, the better constructed walls near the bridge, but more deteriorated walls with smaller, irregular stone further away. These walls don't hold up well against the excavators. This is what you're looking at here is, is uh, one of those disturbed wall sections. Several sections were repaired with poured concrete these late 19th and early 20th century repairs typically were not reinforced, contained very large size aggregate, and seemed to strongly resist demolition. Here's an historic photo of extensive concrete wall replacement west of the auditorium. I, I think it's interesting to see these, these uh, very narrow boardwalks with uh, uh, with wheelbarrows sort of teetering on them. That would be a, quite an exciting job, I think. I wonder how many loads went off that bridge. Here's another section of concrete wall that we located near Cornelia Street in 5S. Utica's canal bridges are potentially significant examples of bridge design evolution. The Genesee and Water Washington Street bridges are very early examples of towerless lift bridges. There are currently 16 bridges of this type operating in western New York that were built along with the Barge Canal in the second decade of the 20th century. Those western bridges were previously thought to be the oldest example of the type. And they may indeed be the oldest functioning examples, but, we, but what we found were parts of, of what would have been their predecessors here in this section of the Erie. And unlike most other bridge variants, which are associated with a named engineer or an architect, these, these towerless lift bridges were notably designed by anonymous state engineers. This historic view looks from Washington Street East with an early Seneca Street Whipple bowstring bridge in the foreground, the Whipple trapezoidal type lift bridge on Hotel Street in the middle, and the Genesee Street bridge in the background with decorated pyramidal cables. I don't know what the occasion was. The Whipple vertical lift bridge is an 
1873 design that was publicly scorned as an ugly skeleton. And that pressure pushed the 1896 Genesee Street Bridge to be something different. Looking south, the Genesee Street Bridge had a stationary hump bridge in the center for trolleys, towerless vertical lift bridges on either side of that for northbound and southbound traffic, and pedestrian bridges outside of those. From the north, this image shows the bridge decorated for an odd fellows parade. Uh, these old photos are great. They show they show the buildings, they show some of the advertisements, um, they show uh, clothing. But one of the things in this picture I really like is the, uh, the sign for the Happy Thought Range over on the right hand side. Interesting name for an appliance. This is a street view from the south, which shows a horse carriage, the auto, uh, a, the trolley and bicycle forms of transportation with the, with the bridge in the background. Here's a picture of the Genesee Street Bridge collapsed in 1909, taken from the north side of the canal, looking west. It appears the phenomenon of gawking, these fellows over here, are, uh, that's, a, that's a common occurrence through time. The New York State Archives holds some of the plans and records that assist in interpreting the masonry and lift mechanisms remaining below grade. The shift from standard vertical lift bridges to towerless lift bridges moves all the moving parts below grade. This schematic of a towerless lift bridge illustrates a bit of how these bridges work and what may remain below grade. You've got a counterweight pit or chamber, the lifting legs, the counterweight itself, the cable, and the shiv or pulley wheel and its axle. In addition to some of those components, we found hydraulic or pneumatic jacks that provided lift to the bridge deck. The bridge, the bridge lift mechanism changed through time using our electric motors hydraulic or pneumatic power systems or a combination. The bridge used the old Waylock building to house those power systems. The Waylock was located at approximately Burnett Street and, and J. Some of the limestone masonry from that building was reused in the construction of the Aristony Battlefield Monument. Here's a jack with some of the masonry removed. And to the right of the jack, there's a portion of a steel jacketed counterweight in here. Research suggests that counterweights consumed 20% of the bridge budget. That, that seems very high to me. At several corners of the Genesee Street Bridge, we documented the iron posts or columns and brackets for the shiv wheels, the remaining cables, the counterweights, and the counterweight guide plates. This is another look at an iron post that had been pulled out of the masonry. These are what are called cast iron pillow block bearings and they're lined with something called Babbitt sleeves. And these were bolted to the top of those posts and held the shiv axle in place. This is a section of a guide plate that was also pulled out of place. And uh, another one of the blocks behind it. Uh, you notice from my mittens that all of this was done in the middle of the winter, which also makes it a bit difficult. This is an exploded schematic that illustrates how the counterweight and the guide plate and the wire rope all articulated. Several years later, the Washington Street Bridge was built. 
looking west, you see this early towerless lift bridge under and beyond the stationary Seneca Street Bridge. At this intersection, we documented counterweight chambers and counterweight guides. These guides were T-shaped and fastened to I-beams that had been embedded in the concrete chamber walls. We also observed an iron framework built into the center of the north chamber. It would look like that. And I, we found an iron plate, an iron strike plate for the bridge deck and that capped the front wall of the south chamber. The below grade remnants of the Washington Street Bridge ultimately mapped out like this. The deck would have spanned the chambers over the towpath. The archives hold several drawing sets showing the superstructure and its workings. The drawing is remarkably similar to the earlier schematic, but it differs in that the cable is attached directly to the lifting post rather than to a, a secondary sheave. Built in 1910, the Seneca Bridge replaced the Whipple Arch Bridge seen in the earlier photographs. This bridge is decidedly different, but that fact took us a while to discern. Like the other bridges, it had a concrete walled counterweight chamber. In fact, this counterweight chamber had been modified by the power company at, to use as a manhole. But the bridge also extended out into the canal prism, unlike the other bridges, and had wing walls back to the south canal wall alignment. The only things we observed on the north side were wooden joists and plank decking over here, approximately where the towpath would have been. Another unusual feature was that it had a toothed iron rack attached to the rear wall of the chamber. And that rack had a slight curvature. Located in the counterweight chamber, we saw an iron, a large iron structural piece found embedded in a mass of concrete reinforced by one and a quarter inch twisted bars. The top edges of that structural iron had been cut by a torch. Initially, we thought these were symmetrical interior frames for the counterweight with the intervening spaces filled with concrete laid out something like this. But we subsequently found the plans for the bridge and found that this, we found out that it's, and here's, here's a name for you, a single leaf trunnion bascule or cantilever bridge. This image shows both the old and the new bridges. It also shows that the bridge span was shorter. An enlarged view shows the chamber, counterweight, and bridge deck both in the down and upright positions. It also shows the curved rack at the back of the pit where the pinions climbed to lower the bridge and descended to raise the bridge. Research so far suggests this is a very unique power system for a bridge. The enlarged view also reveals a girder that was built into the concrete counterweight. The shape is similar to the iron girder section that remained in the chamber. It appears the bridge was raised one last time before the iron was cut and scrapped in 1923. While the barge canal was being built between 1905 and 1918, it's likely little was spent on the repairs, yet the Seneca Bridge was replaced. The Genesee and Washington Street bridges were precursors to the standard towerless lift bridges still used in Western New York. After 1918, the main route of the canal, of course, shifted to the north out of the city, yet the old canal in Utica remained open, providing access for material shipment 
and a reservoir for drawing industrial water and dumping effluent. The Erie Canal through Utica at the end of its life was a smelly, filthy open sewer with haphazardly constructed walls and bridges all in a state of disrepair and failure. Given those conditions, it seems no wonder now why the city erased all above ground traces of the canal and buried it beneath the concrete and asphalt streets and sidewalks. Archaeology offers a refresher, refreshers of the realities of con canal construction, use, and impacts on the people living and working near the canal. It also reveals some of the complexities of construction and repairs, and in general, a clarification of our impressions of the canal and how it functions. That concludes that, this portion of the talk. I can answer a couple of questions now or I'll wait and, until the end. You may recognize this presentation's cartoon title, and I think you'll find it appropriate on many levels. However, this is a story of crime, power, politics, and corruption, similar to those portrayed in Martin Scorsese films and TV series. This account is set in the late 19th century and features a rapidly growing city, industrialization, immigrant laborers, large public works projects, police power, and shady politicians. And it would fill a temporal gap in Scorsese's power and corruption tales. The Shenango Canal was built between 1833 and 1836, connecting Binghamton to Utica. As a lateral to the Erie Canal, the Shenango benefited adjacent communities carrying traffic and products. Although the canal generated insufficient revenues and was largely subsidized by the Erie. The transport of Pennsylvania coal to Utica's steam power industries prompted Utica's resurgence as a manufacturing center in the last half of the 19th century. By mid 1870s, the state support for the canal had weakened. The railroads were capturing a greater portion of freight revenues and the repairs and maintenance were being neglected the Shenango Canal had deteriorated, the prism filling in with sediment, the wood and stone structures rotting and slowly collapsing. The last shipments passed through the canal in 1876. The state legislature officially abandoned it in 1878 while keeping the water course partially open to provide water to the Utica Lunatic Asylum and more importantly, the Erie Canal. During the canal's heyday, the waterway was commonly used to dispose domestic and industrial refuse and human wastes. Privies were built immediately adjacent to or over the canal. All of this continued after abandonment, but with reduced water slowly flowing through the prism, things got worse. The press editorialized about the poor condition and demanded action by the state. One lamented, quote, the greatest grievance is the filthy and unhealthy condition of the canal itself. Nearly every level is a long stagnant pool, exhaling gases and odors, filmed, filled with slime and filth, an annoyance to the eye and a menace to public health, unquote. The city made efforts to increase the water flow clean out obstructions and accumulating materials and regulate illegal dumping. Yet, in contradictory actions, the city of Utica constructed sewer lines that dumped directly into the canal and spread canal dredging spoils on the embankments during summer months, producing very smelly smells. After a decade of the abandoned canal functioning as an open sewer, Lobbying efforts were successful. In June 1887, 
the state adopted a law to fill and grade the Shenango Canal in Utica and granted that law, that land, to the city to defray work costs. The Shenango Canal Commission, comprised of Utica's mayor, surveyor, attorney, and treasurer, was given the authority to plan, contract, and direct the work and apply to the Common Council to raise money through bond sales. At contract conclusion, the board was to contact the state superintendent of public works to conduct a personal inspection and give his final approval prior to the land exchange. The lands were then to be divided and sold to the highest bidders. The commission divided the work into three sections, with the first section between Court Street and lot number five receiving priority attention. Plans specified all the rubbish was to be cleared from the canal, the stone and timber from the waste weirs, culverts, and facilities to be removed. The earthen towpath and the berm banks were to be graded into the prism and the land restored to its original condition. The city engineer was to be the judge of the work and the materials. Work on section one was to be completed by December 1st, 1887. When the city engineer was asked by the mayor if there'd be enough materials to fill the prism, the city engineer, Mr. Smalley said, quote, he had no doubt but that with the distribution of the materials from the locks, there'd be enough to fill the canal. Mr. Sherman, city surveyor, thought that the grade lines were such or should be made such that there'd be material enough, unquote. The five contractors that submitted itemized bids to the commission for section one included, which included the excavation of 30,000 cubic yards of earth. The bids ranged from $8,900 to $6,610, with the low bidding firm of Thomas Wheeler and James J. Dwyer awarded the contract. The first section was completed on time and the city engineer accepted the work. The state superintendent did not conduct an inspection and the commission approved the payment of the estimated balance of $5,876 to Wheeler and Dwyer. There are no records of bid solicitations for the second and third section contracts, yet Wheeler and Dwyer were awarded the work. The press reported controversies regarding inspections, missing documentation, and accounting. Remarkably, the contract payments were only occasionally temporarily withheld. Again, another whiff of a smelly smell. New York State Museum's Cultural Resource Survey Program excavations at Shenango Lock Number Three, which is at 1026, 1028 Lincoln Ave, found plenty of evidence that Wheeler and Dwyer did not meet the standards established in the contract plans. We found over five vertical feet of masonry at the head of the lock, along with its supporting timber base. This represents the lower six feet of masonry reserved by the state in its 1882 material sale from the Shenango. Our excavations exposed the lower portions of the timber frame, decking, and masonry foundation of the sluice flume. Upright members of the flume had been removed or salvaged. We also uncovered the stone walls and plank decking of the sluice ditch. The specifications called for the removal of all accumulated garbage and rubbish. The ditch had been in fact filled with an assortment of rubbish, garbage, and ash. The firm may have incorporated the relatively clean fills of the embankments but these had been thoroughly mixed with solid wastes. This profile shows the approximate grade levels of the pre-1887 work and the post-1887 grade. A wider perspective includes the edge of the lock on the right and shows the pre-1882 grade 
the 1882 to 87 grade and the post-1887 grade. It appears the prescribed inspections by the city engineer and the state superintendent were not conducted in a timely manner, if at all, Some more smelly smells. So let's begin to follow our noses. The Dwyer and Wheeler Contracting Company was established by two old friends, Thomas Wheeler and James J. Dwyer. Although this firm did not last much longer than this canal project, the two men were closely associated for their adult lives. Thomas Wheeler was born in 1845, approximately two blocks away from lock number three. The son of Irish immigrants, Thomas left school after his dad's death in 18, 1858 and began working in Utica's cotton and wool mills. James Dwyer was born in Ireland in 1843, coming to the United States with his parents at a young age. He grew up on a New Hartford farm and worked in a livery business. Dwyer was appointed to the Utica police force in 1860 and became its chief in 1874. On his second attempt to enlist, the Army accepted Wheeler at age 16 in 1862. He proved himself as a determined fighter at Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, and the Battle of the Wilderness, rising to the rank of lieutenant by the end of the war. Of the 1,568 Oneida enlistees, Wheeler was among the 427 survivors of their three-year tour. Notably, the commander of the 1st Oneida Regiment was Colonel, later General, James McQuaid, who twice was elected mayor of Utica in 1866 and 1870. After the war, an unsettled Wheeler returned to work a series of jobs in a woolen mill, a shoe factory, and as a night watchman. His reputation as a tough fighter and scrapper continued, and he became involved in various criminal activities, leading to convictions of larceny in 1867 and of the assault of a clergyman in 1869. Regardless of the convictions, the former commander, now Mayor General McQuaid, appointed Tom Wheeler as a policeman in 1870. Simultaneously, he worked as a policeman and special detective for the New York Central and Hudson River Railroads. Newspapers reported Wheeler made, quote, efforts to save the offender and put him on the right path, unquote, rather than inflate his arrest statistics. Given his past and his eventual political power, I doubt his motives were altruistic. Through granting leniency at the street level, Wheeler was amassing favors and compiling information, useful tools of political persuasion. Wheeler left the Utica police in 1873. Dwyer became chief in 1874, holding that position for eight years. Wheeler continued as railroad detective, but also became a detective in the Oneida County District Attorney's Office. Depositions taken by the Utica Police and Fire Commission in 1875 associated Wheeler with burglaries, stolen goods, and Irish gangsters in Utica, Albany, and Boston. Yet he managed to keep his detective jobs. Chief Dwyer was also the targets of charges of impropriety during this period, but was eventually vindicated of all charges. Representing the county and city Respectively, Detective Wheeler and Chief Dwyer took many trips together conducting prisoner transfers and extraditions. Utica's Board of Health first appointed Wheeler as sanitary policeman in 1878, and he worked periodically through 1881. This position afforded Wheeler opportunities to develop a thorough understanding of the public sanitation system and established permitting control over waste contractors and haulers. By the late 1870s, 
Thomas Wheeler had become active in local politics, gaining considerable power while staying out of the public view. The details of Wheeler's rise to become Republican Party boss in Oneida County are undocumented. Yet by 1884, journalists reported, quote, it was an open secret that he practically dictated the nominations for both parties locally, unquote. James Dwyer, was also active in ward politics during the early 1880s, but his involvements led to either his dismissal or resignation as chief. After two years as superintendent of Utica's Bleecker Street Railway, Dwyer left Utica for Minnesota for several years, where he learned the construction and contracting trades. With, as Wheeler's power grew during the early 1880s, he remained a detective but also partnered with the local Democratic boss, Dave Dishler, in saloons, gambling, and allegedly prostitution. The proceeds from these operations were funneled into political patronage, the foundation of Wheeler's machine. As evidence of Wheeler's power and eventual reach, Wheeler installed James Schoolcraft Sherman as chairman of the Oneida County Republican Committee in 1883 and delivered the Utica mayorship in 1884 to the then 29-year-old. He later assisted Sherman to a congressional seat in 1887 and again to the vice presidency under Taft. Wheeler arranged his own appointment as commissioner on the Utica's Board of Health, serving from 1883 through 1888. Board duties varied, but included employing inspectors, permitting waste haulers, and recommending additions to sewers and other health-related infrastructure. In 1886, Wheeler was appointed de detective and deputy sheriff of Oneida County, first winning an election as sheriff in 1889. During this election, he famously confronted his opponent, Charles Hackett, and, and it was documented by the press with, quote, as him saying, quote, there are only two corrupt men in Oneida County. You are one and I am the other. You never got any office in your life that you didn't buy. I know because I bought it for you. Around 1887, Dwyer had returned to Utica and partnered with Wheeler in the contracting business. The smelly smell was getting smellier. With Wheeler's Board of Health Commission, an entity that lobbied for sewer construction and the elimination of the abandoned Chenango Canal, his influence over every member of the Canal Commission, as well as the aldermen who comprised the Common Council, it seems no small conflict of interest that Wheeler and Dwyer were awarded the con canal contract. Wheeler likely had inside knowledge regarding competing bids and undercut the next lowest bid by just $45. His contacts with and permitting powers over local rubbish, garbage, and ash haulers may have provided a source of fill materials, perhaps collecting revenues for their disposal, saving trucking costs, and getting paid to fill the canal. Wheeler had provided engineer Smalley and surveyor Sherman their jobs, ensuring that no real inspections would occur and no inspection reports would be filed. Besides having the Shenango Canal project, Wheeler and Dwyer had a small city contract for bridge construction in 1887. And in a, a solo venture, Dwyer captured a lion's share of the city's sewer construction contracts between 1887 and 1900. Uh, as, a, as an aside at this point, um, it's also interesting to find that Wheeler, being on the, the health board, uh, pushed for and got an act requiring um, pumps, sanitary pumps, to be used on people's privies. And as it turned out, Wheeler was one of the owners of the only business in town that had the sanitary pumps. The depth and extent 
of Oneida County and City of Utica political corruption was widely known and garnered statewide attention. Incredibly, despite all the bad publicity, Wheeler was elected mayor of Utica in 1892. While breaking up an asphalt monopoly, a significant portion of the new road construction contracts were directed to the Utica Paving Company, owned by none other than James Dwyer. Wheeler lost re-election, and to further his political makeover, he launched a coal business with the city clerk, P.J. McQuaid, younger brother of General McQuaid. This business eventually became McQuaid and Bannigan, who you all may know are still in existence, very near the coal pocket that they used to own in the middle of the, uh, which was located in the middle of the arterial. Wheeler had friends on the Republican State Committee and in 1895, he was appointed Assistant State Superintendent of Public Works under George Aldridge, who was the party boss of Rochester. This job gave him access to state canal system patronage jobs for the next 12 years, and also allowed him to steer numerous, often non-competitive repair contracts to James Dwyer. Wheeler was one of Aldridge's, quote, shadiest appointments, according to the press. Yet, he outlasted the scandalous Aldridge, four subsequent superintendents, and five successive governors. He even survived General Theod Governor Theodore Roosevelt's vigorous purge of political appointees. Wheeler was re-elected Utica's mayor in 1907, appointing Dwyer as superintendent of public works during his term. Subsequent to Wheeler's failed re-election bid in 1909, Vice President Sherman appointed him as Utica's postmaster, a position that gave Wheeler control over federal patronage jobs and maintained Republican power in the county. Thomas Wheeler, also known as the old man, died in 1916 in his home, several blocks from his birthplace and from the old Shenango Canal route, capped by a street bearing his name. James Dwyer died two years afterward. His obituary included much regarding his political and business associations with Wheeler. Most of the controversial history of Thomas Wheeler and James Dwyer is based on circumstantial evidence and the reporting of what were highly partisan political newspapers. The archeological evidence at Shenango Canal Lock Number Three for contractual malfeasance is pretty solid. On a larger scale, the creation of the Dwyer and Wheeler Contracting Company was an initial step into the more legitimate and more lucrative business activities. Wheeler initially gained political power through physical domination, the accumulation of street level dirt and dirty laundry, graduating to saloons, gambling and prostitution. Contracting municipal public works projects was a less sleazy, less smelly venture and Wheeler and Dwyer's state level contracting even more profitable. Both men were accomplished and through their deeds and favors, won the support of many people through the years. The means to their ends appear rather scandalous, but were quite normal for their times. Their capacity to advance through difficulties and position themselves to gain greater power and small fortunes remains astonishing. <laughs>